contexts. James puts this faith in the context of being lived out. When was the last time you found yourself in, a, in the middle of a storm? You think back, you may be in one now. I've heard there's only three types of people, those who are in a storm, those who are coming out of a storm, and those who are headed into a storm. <laughs> so either way, um, we get to be familiar with this in the Christian life. So how well did you handle yourself in the last storm? Anything you'd done differently? You may be just, if you're in the middle of one now, you may be just hanging on. Matter of fact, you, it may have been all you could do just to get here today. And in some sense, your guts are hanging out and you really don't know what you need to do. <laughs> we just looked at a passage in Genesis chapter 22 can't imagine what was going through the mind of Abraham when he's gathering the wood. With his son with him. This morning we're going to look at trials and tribulations and I'm standing here this morning as one who's spent a fair amount of time looking through this passage to try to understand it, and even this week struggled with living it out in its fullness. As we consider these truths, my prayer for all of us is that the truth of this passage will impact our lives, that it will take root in our hearts, and that God will enlighten us and empower us to the reality of this truth. Let's take a look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 of James. If you would stand in honor of God's word, and we'll, I'll read this. And we'll just go uh, verses 1 through 4. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Father, as we delve into this passage in something that is so easy for us to read and to look at, <laughs> and help us to consider the depths of this command, to consider it all joy when we face trials of many kinds. Father, we cannot do that without the enabling power of your Spirit. We cannot do that if we don't intentionally, with a mind towards Scripture, pursue these truths. We pray that you would be glorified in everything that's done today. We pray that you would help me to convey your message to us, your people, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. In the context of this old epistle of James, this is not a book about a development of Christian doctrine, but rather a book of Christianity that's, that's applied and, and practiced and what that looks like. Here we have the legacy of James' teaching and wisdom condensed into a very short and very powerful book. It begins like a letter, but, and he greets the Messianic Jews who've been living outside of the land of Israel. But it does not read like one of Paul's letters. There he's talking about addressing specific issues that are in the church. 
And kind of by contrast, James here, as being the pastor of this church that has developed relationships with these people, he, he comes in here now and he's, he's admonishing and encouraging them to live as they've been called to live. He wants to challenge how they live and how we live. One commentator said, when you read James, James will get in your business. So get ready. <laughs> in essence, James is calling his readers to become truly wise. By living according to Jesus' summary of the law and the commands to love God and to love others more than ourselves. The book of James throughout implies that genuine Christian faith and belief in God will result in a righteousness which will produce a lifestyle of obedience. James shows us faith in action. Not just something to believe in or something to have, but faith in action. The book of James is concerned with the activity of faith rather than the substance of faith. It describes the outcome of genuine faith. So let's take a look at verses 1 through 4. James 1 tells us, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Greetings. It's interesting how James refers to himself here. Now, when I re first read through this, I thought, this is the half-brother of Jesus. I mean, if I was going to write someone, I think I would have thrown something like that in. I mean, wouldn't you? I mean, if you were the half-brother of Jesus, wouldn't you, like when you were writing formally, wouldn't you kind of let people know, hey, this is, you, you know who I am, right? <laughs> I mean, I lived with Jesus. <laughs> he takes an entirely different route here. He calls himself a bondservant. Depicting himself as a slave, one who gives himself up to another's will. A bondservant is devoted to another to the disregard of one's own interest. So leading off with that, their pastor, who they had labored with, identifies himself as a bondservant, a slave, and then he says in verses 2 through 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. It seems that this is one of the hardest lesson, lessons that Christians have to learn, to be joyful in the middle of pain and suffering. But James tells us here to consider this. Some versions may say, count it all joy. This means that it's an idea of reckoning or considering we are to consider what we are going through as a matter of joy. Not because the thing in and of itself is joyful or pleasurable, but because tribulation works patience within us. Someone here in our congregation told me, it's been three or four months ago, maybe it, probably longer than that. Don't ever ask for patience. God will give you six kids. He did me. <laughs> Patience is not something we just get up in the morning and we think, or maybe even like on our bucket list, right? If I, if I can just get to the end of my life and have patience developed in my character, that'll be a great win for me. We don't think that way. I'm busy about doing my stuff. I'm not worried about your stuff, and I'm not worried about waiting on you to try to get your stuff. I'm worried about me. The 
there is at least one good thing happening to us in the middle of pain and suffering is developing patience. In order to count earthly afflictions joy, we have to be able to take into account the future. Our joy must be based on looking to God and the inheritance that we will receive in heaven. So in addition to seeing this as God has a purpose for us and that purpose is always good and we're to count all things joy because God is working in those things, we also need to look into the future and be reminded of the future that lies ahead. We must realize that the suffering we endure in this life cannot compare with the joy that is laid up for us in heaven. But in the moment, in the middle of it, it's difficult. It's hard to keep our eyes focused on the future. But we must hold on to the hope that this suffering is only momentary. That our hope, what enables us to count it all joy when we are enduring suffering and pain. To be able to do that, we have to trust God. There's no other way around that. Do you have that kind of confidence in the sovereignty and goodness of God? Tough question. We're usually quick to get around around conversations around how sovereign God is in all things. But boy, when you get hit with something and it literally rocks you back, I'm not sure sovereignty is the first thing that pops into my head. Do we look to, the, to Christ in the middle of our sufferings or do we tend to focus on the present situation until we are consumed by it? We must ask God to help us rejoice in him in order to be able to count it all joy. John Piper wrote a book several years back now, Desiring God. And in that he says that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. In my trial, in my suffering, do I desire God? Do I desire God so much that I'm overwhelmingly satisfied in him and in him alone? Tough questions. And the only way we can prepare ourselves for this is intentionally focusing on trusting God and being in His Word. I saw uh, Linda found this from um, Max Licato. God allows tough situations in our lives in order to refine us and bring us closer to Him. We should approach these times with a right attitude and seek wisdom from God. He goes on to talk about how when a potter is baking pottery, that they'll pull it out of the oven and they'll thump it. What they hear back, if it sings, then it's, it's finished. If they thump it and they hear a thud, then it goes back in the oven. Thinking through that in the context of what we're looking at here, there seems to be some points about how my character may be evaluated by God. (laughs) Have you been thumped lately? Late night phone calls, grouchy teacher, grumpy moms, burnt meals, flat tires. How about some of those, you've got to be kidding me, deadlines? Those are thumps. 
Thumps are those irritating inconveniences that trigger the worst in us. They catch us off guard, flat-footed. They aren't big enough to be a crisis, but if you get enough of them, watch out. Traffic jams, long lines, empty mailboxes, dirty clothes on the floor. Thump, thump, thump. How do you respond? Do I sing or do I thud? Luke chapter 6, verse 45 says, The good pleasure, I'm sorry, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Boy, when we're in one of these situations, it just seems like our heart is laid bare for everyone to see because of how we respond. And sometimes we may be almost shocked at some of the things that we say. And we may even, if, especially if we're in front of people, it's like, well, I don't know where that came from. Well, we do, right? I mean, this passage tells us that it's coming right straight out of our heart. Our guard is down. We don't, we don't have our Christian uh, face on, our mask on. <laughs> There's nothing like a good thump to reveal the nature of our heart. The true character of a person is seen not in momentary heroics, but in the thump-packed humdrum of day-to-day -day living. I was looking through um, a couple of things that I had found online. And Dr. MacArthur listed at least eight purposes for the Lord allowing trials to come into the lives of his people. I want us to kind of think through these eight things. The first thing that comes around in these trials, the purpose, if you will, is to test the strength of our faith. Boy, we, and we see this in Hezekiah, Second Chronicles chapter 32 how God left him. In Habakkuk, chapter 3, he was facing the threat of the Chaldeans coming and wiping out his people. And then also in Job, chapter 42, Job questioning God's wisdom and sovereignty when the trials he experienced had exposed the weakness of his faith. Second thing we see is trials humble us. Second Corinthians chapter 12 says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Paul had seen a vision of Jesus in his resurrected glory. Also, God had bestowed on him the power to do miracles and revealed new truth. Such unique gifts could have led him to be proud, but God struck him with a very chronic problem that forced him to rely on God. Paul's thorn, mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 here, as he described it, was a messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Trials have a way of humbling us. Whatever it was, God used that trial to lead Paul to humbly depend on him. God allows trials in our lives to keep us humble, especially when we are blessed to be in a position of spiritual service. They can prevent us from becoming overconfident. So trials test the strength of our faith. Trials test, uh, they humble us. And number three, trials wean us from worldly things. 
This was one that caught me off guard a little bit when I first read it. But it seems like the longer that we live here on earth, the more we accumulate. Have you found that in your life? When we moved into the house that we're in now, we had one room that didn't have hardly any furniture in it at all. And the living room didn't have a lot of furniture in it. And we have plenty of furniture now. The house is full. The attic's full. We, we have to back stuff out of the shed in order to get to other stuff that's in the shed. I received some good advice when we first moved in. I think it's a 12 by 18 outbuilding. And I was told, do not ever buy a bigger one. You'll just fill it up. <laughs> good advice. Trials wean us from worldly things. In the spite of increase of worldly goods and pleasures, those things tend to have less and less significance in the Christian life. There was probably a time when you were thinking, man, if, if I have all of these things, they can take care of most of my problems. They may have been even most desirable, but many times we come to realize they are incapable of solving the anxieties, the hurts, and the real problems of life. Think about this. When trials come into our lives and we reach out for those worldly things, you see what little lasting difference they make. Trials can wean us away from worldly things as they demonstrate their total inability to solve any problem or provide any resource in a time of stress. This is exemplified by Jesus in John 6 when Jesus poses Philip with a problem of feeding 5,000 people. Philip's response was from a worldly viewpoint. He commented that he and the other disciples didn't have enough money to go buy food to feed this kind of a crowd. Jesus wanted to display whether Philip looked to worldly resources or to Jesus himself for the answer. Once the disciples' inability to meet the need had, gone, had been established, Jesus went on to demonstrate his miraculous power and lifted them to greater faith in him. Also, we see this in Moses. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26, tells us that he considered the sacrifices made in identifying with God's purpose. Moses said these were greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Those are the things he counted most dear than all of the treasures in Egypt. He had gotten his eyes off worldly things available to him and began to be concerned about trials of his people. The Lord uses this type of trial to wean us and to wean him away from passing pleasures. Number four, Trials call us to eternal hope. The trials in our lives increase our anticipation for heaven. This is kind of the, the flip side of number three, that it weans us away from worldly things and it calls us to an eternal hope. For example, to be united with a loved one who has passed on to be with the Lord. If, if most precious people in your life have entered into the presence of our Lord and Savior. And if you have invested your time and money in eternal things, then you won't have much tying you to this passing world. Number five, trials reveal what we really love. Apart from, apart from God, nothing could have been dearer to Abraham than his own son Isaac. But that was the test. To find out whether he loved Isaac more than he loved God. If we supremely love God, we will thank God for what he is accomplishing through them. 
But if we, love our, if we love ourselves more than God, we will question God's wisdom and become upset and perhaps even bitter. If anything is dearer to us than God, then he must remove it for us to grow spiritually. Several years back with a, a group of college-age folks. We talked about the things that we hold on to this world and we just kept trying to encourage one another, just, just let go, just let go. If you hold on, the only thing you're gonna get is rope burns, so just let go. And one young man I had lunch with even kind of had taken that a step further and he said, you know, I'm really seeing more in my life that I don't need to have my hand out expecting God to place in there whatever he wants me to have and to take away what he doesn't want me to have. He's like, in my mind, I'm almost seeing like I need to be approaching life with my hands this way. And the only things that can attach themselves and secure themselves and mean anything in my life are those things that he attaches it's not for me to hold on to anything. Interesting coming from the life of a young man, 19, 20 years old. Trials reveal what we really love. Number six. Trials teach us to value God's blessings. The world tells us that life is just the here and now, and that we should enjoy this at any price. But faith tells us to value God's word, to obey it, to receive his blessings. Trials teach us the blessings of obedience. When we obey God's will in the middle of a trial, we are blessed. We see this in Psalm chapter 63. David says, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. We also see this in Jesus as a perfect example of one who was blessed for his obedience. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Number seven, trials enable us to help others in their suffering. There's very little in this world that happens to us that is just about us. Sometimes when suffering comes, it may have no greater purpose than to make us better able to assist others in their own suffering. All Christians. All Christians have a responsibility to help those who are suffering. We see this in Luke chapter 22, where he tells him, strengthen your brothers. We also see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. It tells us that we go through trials for the purpose of comforting others with the comfort that we have received. It it's wonderful that God allows us to learn by experience to instruct others. That's part of what this whole disciple-making process is about. If I don't have anything to, to share, if I haven't gone through any types of difficult situations, it's a whole lot harder. I mean, I may be able to sympathize, but I don't think I can empathize with with people nearly like that. I mean, it's, it's just different. I can feel for you that you're going through that. But if you've been through some of life's tough things, the, the, the death of a child, a spouse walking out, the death of a spouse, God just removes something from your life. And it, it could be a job or anything. Going through that, people see what's really inside of us. And it helps us to look back and to see that God is faithful. 
that we can trust him. And it allows us to be able to sit across the table from someone and say, I understand. Number eight, trials produce endurance and strength. Thomas Manton, an English Puritan, said, while all things are quiet and comfortable, we live by sense rather than by faith. But the worth of a soldier is never tested in times of peace. One of God's purposes in trials is to give us greater strength. As we go through one trial, our spiritual muscles or faith are exercised and strengthened for the next one. That means that you can face greater foes and endure greater obstacles. This becomes more and more useful to our Lord in, in using us. And the more useful we are, the more we will accomplish his will in the power of his spirit for his glory. In these verses, James tells his readers that the basis for the joy commanded in verse 2, namely that testing produces a faith which makes us complete, perfect, lacking nothing. What a reason for joy. Think about this next statement. Our problem is that we focus on circumstances rather than on God's purpose. And because of this, we don't view trials the way we should. Several years back, Linda and I went through almost two years of me not being employed. We learned a lot about each other. I had gotten used to the concept of a budget, but then came the skinny budget. And then after about six months or eight months, that budget, I think it became anorexic more than just skinny. <laughs> Man, you learn a lot. Someone shared with me kind of in the middle of all that something that's just stuck with me since. When I see my circumstances, do, do I see my circumstances through the cross? Or do I see the cross through my circumstances. It's just another way of putting what we've already said here before. But they literally drew that out, a stick figure, and my circumstance, and then the cross. And it's really easy for me to get absorbed in this circumstance if I'm seeing it in front of the cross. But oh, what a difference. When I take the cross, and I put it in front of my circumstances. It paints those circumstances in an entirely different light. Because I know my Redeemer lives. I know there's nothing that I can face on this world that's any more difficult than what he faced in laying down his life for all who would believe in him. I know that I can't doubt his love. He demonstrated that unconditionally while I was still a sinner. It just changes everything, having that picture in my mind. God has a purpose for each of us, and it's to conform us to the image of Christ. And I'm just going to reference these. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. We see it in John chapter 9. It is very important that we view trials as part of God's sovereign purpose and plan. And Brother Bill has mentioned this to us several times, that God is too wise to be mistaken, and he is too good to be unkind. 
we might ask at this point, to, who does our, or to whom does our faith need to be proved? Well, it's certainly not to God. He knows, right? So who in the world would our faith need to be proven to? Me. <laughs> I can say whatever it is I want to say. I can quote scriptures. I, I can tell you how I'm going to respond. But when I see myself there, it's all different. And just by the way, another reason why it is very critical for us to surround ourselves with people who will help sharpen us and who will help call us up to the life that we've been commanded to live. I don't know if you've heard of an organization uh, or uh, actually, it's just a, an email that I get called Grace Gems. Came across this back in the late 90s, uh, years ago. I've been getting these emails uh, regularly. I just wanted to share this one with you. It says, we also rejoice in our afflictions. We also rejoice in our afflictions because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance pr proves produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This James Michael goes on to, to say that man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Sometimes God kindly sends afflictions to chastise his people for sin and curb their carnal afflic afflictions. Yet at other times he sends Afflictions to exercise and improve their graces. If you're here this morning, and wherever you are and whatever your relationship is with the Lord, Know that afflictions do not spring out of the dust, nor come at random. Some of God's favorite ones have, for wise ends, had the severest afflictions. I should welcome whatever afflictions loosen me from this world and bring me near to God. Talk about a hard prayer. That's a hard prayer. Whatever will loosen me from this world and draw me closer to you, that's what I want. That's what I desire. If you've been facing life's trials without God, without the nearness of his presence, without a purpose, you can't have that today. By calling out to him and placing your faith and trust in him, you can have that. If you've been saved by grace through faith, you are to consider what you're going through as a matter of joy. Because tribulation works patience within us, realizing that God has a purpose, remembering the inheritance that lies before us that we will receive in heaven, and suffering is momentary that you can trust God and know that when you get thumped by life, it's time to sing. Let's pray. Father, we come to you again mulling over this passage and understanding the words but looking back in our, in our lives when we've gone through difficult times, it seems like many, if not most of the times, we really didn't sing. We really didn't trust you. We really did not consider it all joy. So Father, we come to you repenting where we've not done that. 
I'm asking you to take these words from James to encourage our hearts, to drive us to a greater commitment, to desire to be loosed from the things that entangle us in this life so that we can follow you. Father, help us to do that. Help us to wholeheartedly commit ourselves to you for your glory in Jesus' name.